There's this whole subgenre of fantasy growing around farming. There's a lot of embedded culture in mm -hmm. agriculture. There is a sturdiness to people who farm mm. that is, is sort of astonishing. It is basically the sum total of millennia of trial and error. They tend to have just a surprising amount of knowledge. I submit to Unwee and gaze into the abyss. Yeah. <laughs> it just inherits the farm from like a drow cousin. <laughs> yes. It's like, what do I yes. do with giants, tag beetles, and spiders? <laughs> if your farmers can read, yeah. everybody in the society can read. Yeah. Because the farmer is the person with the least amount of time to learn how to do that. Hello and welcome to the Worldcraft Club podcast, a show for writers looking to create rich, immersive settings that will bring their readers back time and time again. And today, we're going to be talking about a little bit of a neglected topic, I think, mostly because when I looked it up on TV tropes, I could find very little about it particularly. So I suspect that no one's really written anything significant about this whatsoever. Topic, of course, is farming. Um, this is kind of interesting. Farming was pivotal to the kind of creation of civilization as we know it. It was the thing that allowed people to plant their feet in the ground and remain somewhere. It allowed populations to grow, infrastructure to build around it. It was really the starting point for a lot of that, but is often not considered a subject that would merit the interest of a reader. And I don't think that's true. I think there's actually a lot to this and a lot you can benefit from by diving into it in your world building. So my name's James and I'm joined here by Seth. How are you doing, Seth? I'm doing great. Yeah. As I said, not a lot out there on farming, right? So <laughs> do you want to just like spill, spill the beans? Why, why, sure. why is that a joke? <laughs> um, because there's an entire subgenre of lit RPG, which is the genre I write in, yeah. um, including a series of mine that's eight books long, called Battle Mage Farmer. Ah. Um, and, and it's not just a clever name. There actually is a farmer. It is, it is about a farmer, a guy who all he wants to do is be on his farm and grow his crops and make cheese. Yeah. So he, he runs a dairy farm uh, in the series. But there's, there's this whole subgenre of fantasy growing around farming uh, stories. You and might it's, say it's being cultivated. It, I might have said that, but I didn't. <laughs> you carefully avoided. I carefully saying avoided that. saying that. But yeah. yes, there's there's uh, it's it's a it's a growing genre. There's a lot of interest in it, um, and I think it's really fascinating yeah. actually that people are so interested in this. Um, we're we're even seeing a just a general resurgence in interest in sort of. Um, off-grid living or home homesteading, homesteading. Yeah, yeah. you know, there's a lot of people who are interested in, in sort of getting back to the earth. And fantasy books or uh, shows or whatever are a, a great way to get a taste of that if you can't do that yourself in your own life. Yeah, I, again, we come back to escapism, right? Like there is something about it and something, like, I mean, when I think farming, it's it, my initial thoughts were, oh, you know, that's that's kind of cozy. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, it's the cozy core kind of thing. It's like, that's nice. Um, but the more that I thought about it, and I, I canvassed the server, and I, I've got, like, a whole list of thank yous to give because just the server just <laughs> came out weirdly strong on farming. <laughs> like, it was just, I'm there was a you, lot a of deal. discussion. So it's like, you know, it's it's a lot of people weighed in. And um, it, was, it was kind of fascinating. I... I it got me thinking about how much our food and where it comes from really impacts a setting and really shapes things. One of the first things that kind of came up was um, Rach from the server had mentioned the Three Sisters. Are you familiar with this? The so, so it's the uh, Fates. No, no, it's um, so this is this is the actually no, it's, it's Native American folklore. Um, but it was actually a, a farming principle. So the three sisters are corn, beans, and a gourd. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. And what would happen is the corn stalk grew and supported the beans as they mm -hmm. grew around it, and the gourd created ground cover yep. such that it prevented weeds. Yeah. And this was like essentially an ancient agriculture practice. Yeah, so actually yeah. Um, I was, was not aware of, so it's fascinating. of <laughs> yeah. the three sisters in particular, but I remember... Um, I grew up in West Africa yeah. in a small village, 
and uh, without running water. And I remember going to the farm, not our farm, but going with um, another person from the local area um, to their farm. And I remember working and planting the corn and the beans. And so you would make a hole and you would drop two, uh, two kernels of corn and a bean into the hole. Yeah. And you would do that all the way down because yeah. the corn would start growing and then the bean, sh uh, the bean would start growing as well. But because of the time difference, the bean always had a stalk to grow up. Yeah. And so that was a very common thing, even in the middle of Africa. Yeah. And this is sort of buddy crops. It's something I just didn't know. And, and it was fascinating because there's a lot of like kind of, of folklore and myth built around that as well. That even like these, these three sisters turn up in some mythology. And it just occurred to me that like, that kind of led me down this path. Any sort of hobby, career, sort of niche of society where there is a great deal of uncertainty, there's also myth. Mm. If you look at sailing, right? Like you'll get folks who get tattoos, you know, to ward off evil spirits and things like that. It's because there's just tons of uncertainty. You could die any minute you're out there in the sea. The sea is a mm -hmm. cruel mistress. And like, you know, then, then there's theater, break a leg. You do not say good luck to somebody getting on the stage. You say break a leg. And some of that is just mythology because when you get on stage, pretty much anything can happen. You know, like stuff can just go wrong. A crowd can just hate you one night. You can be on fire and everyone is just not interested. You know, or mm -hmm. you can have a night where you just sucked and for some reason the crowd just ate it up. And it was just like that, that it became mystical. And farming is the same, right? Because you could have a drought one year and everything could fail. So we have gods and goddesses of, of the harvest. You know, you have people sort of building this mythology, sort of like, like the three sisters became sort of a sort of a folklore entity, series of entities in themselves. There's actually this rich traditional landscape in there that's just mm -hmm. has a lot to it. It's something that it just hadn't even occurred to me, like the role that could play in a culture and how you could quickly get an understanding or identity of a culture mm -hmm. through, in some ways, their, their farming practice. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting thing to think about. I, I feel like you find in farmers, in addition to some of those superstitions, in addition to some of those um, ways of doing things, yeah, um, it, you know the uh, putting out putting out milk for brownies, f yeah, trickster spirits, um, or putting out offerings uh, for the dwarves in Ghana, yeah. Um, whose feet are backwards, by the way. I just think that's a really cool fact that I have to mention. Um, so if you see there- the, I'm thinking you, about backwards feet. Yeah, not sorry. Happy about if, if you see <laughs> footprints yeah. around the edge of your field, you have to make sure to go the opposite direction. Or I'm sorry, you have to make sure to go the direction they're pointing, because if you run the opposite direction, you'll run into them oh. because their feet are backwards. Gotcha, makes sense. Yeah, anyway. But, you know, it makes me think about all of these all of these different ways that people throughout history in agricultural societies have sort of mitigated danger yeah. in the world. But then that also leads me to think about the kinds of people who survive in those situations of yeah. high uncertainty. Yeah. You know, there is, there is, a, there is a sturdiness to people who farm Mm. that is is sort of astonishing. And so if you are building a fantasy society yeah. or if you're building a medieval society or if you're building really any kind of society at all, there are certain truisms about people who till the land or who cultivate crops, mm. who, you know, uh, herd or raise livestock there are things that are almost universally true yeah. about them. Yeah. They tend to be really tough. They tend to have just a surprising amount of knowledge about, not, not about theoretical things, but about intensely practical things. Usually knowing which way north is without being told, like knowing yeah. constellations and things like that, like yeah. weather patterns. Well, so, so, <laughs> You know, the farmer's almanac. Yeah. 
was a collection of this kind of wisdom, yeah, right? Divining rods, actually. <laughs> it's me right. thinking about that finding water. You know, and, yeah. and there are, and, and what's fascinating is that this sort of folk wisdom yeah. that this very hardy type of person might buy into isn't built on, on just superstition. They wouldn't do it if it didn't work, yeah. at least some of the time. Yeah. Right. And so when you when you start to look at, you know, um, the people who would come out of these communities, one of my favorite interactions uh, with this sort of concept was during a, a TTRPG game I was playing and um, my party ran into, you know, some bandits outside a village. We get picked up after the fight is over. One of us is wounded. We're trying to go find a healer. And the farmer was like, oh, we don't have a healer, but that's fine. And then just took us back to his house and and helped the wounded character with some... Um, Made a poultice. Yeah, just, yeah. you know, grabbed some plants and, and slapped them together. Chewed them up. And, pretty much. Yeah. And was like, hey, this works. And it was a really cool moment, not because... Not because there was something like magical about what that character was doing or that that character was particularly important, but because it was just such an accurate representation of what you might find if you walk into one of these communities. Somebody who's willing to lend a helping hand. Yeah. Somebody who doesn't have any... There's nothing particularly, um, you know, highbrow. Like self-reliant but community-oriented. Yeah, self-reliant right? but community-oriented. Is it, Yeah, I love that. And so it was just fascinating. Like, that was a really cool moment to me of being like, oh, I know these kinds of people. And, and, and this is the thing, is that there's a ton of embedded wisdom in that. And it is basically the sum total of millennia of trial and error. That's right. And like, this is like one of the things that we do when we're actually, so, so some of the work I do is, in, is involved with, you know, bigger sort of broad, planning efforts with with water resources and one of the things that they often do is they they will consult with with um, tribes for tribal knowledge in the area because they know if you plant your feet somewhere for a thousand years you learn about it right and that wisdom ends up being embedded in sayings and it ends up being embedded in myth and mm -hmm. folklore mm -hmm. and like there is something to unpack in that and like that was kind of that was the thing that i found fascinating and how that would impact and change a culture and sort of drive them a certain direction i love that you mentioned as well the sort of like hardened sort of like stoicism almost mm -hmm. like uh, and and that that comes from sadness and loss in a lot of ways and like not knowing what's around the corner it's right. weird that like having an incredibly uncertain life leads to radical steadiness <laughs> like, <laughs> yes in a person it's like yeah everything around you is crazy you're steady you know because you like, have to be yeah because it's that or die and the ability to it's clarifying it, it's incredibly clarifying humanity's ability to adapt to very difficult circumstances and very difficult situations, I think is one thing that isn't sort of explored enough in, mm. in books. Yeah. But in reality, like people figure out how to get by. Yeah. People figure out how, like what they can eat. Yeah. I, I watched a really um, sort of disgusting, but fascinating TV show once where they were going through food from different ages. Yeah. And one of the things that I thought was w the most interesting episode to me was was one on um, England during World War II. Well, that explains why it was disgusting. But carry on. The things that they were suggesting people eat were just wild. They literally came from the field. People would go out and they would gather food from their surroundings because they couldn't get foraging yeah foraging. There, they actually, couldn't get enough themselves there's still a strong foraging culture in england like it's well, it's and well it's, understood and it's be it's wild it's yeah. partly because of this they talked about that in the show yeah there was this resurgence during that time as people started to go out to talk to the to the communities that knew how to do that yeah still we're still practicing it right and that's something that that's sort of fascinating is that there is a wisdom mm. in agricultural communities, in farming communities, 
that we have just lost mm. because everything has become easy, because everything has become simple, right? If I'm hungry and I don't have food in my house, I either get in my car and go to the grocery store or I get on my app and I order Uber Eats. I submit to ennui and gaze into the abyss. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, and I mean, like, I, I think this not this this sort of in inbuilt knowledge is something that we kind of struggle with. We sort of, um, I think, as a culture, tend to feel like we just like we just invented everything and just like pull it. You know, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And like, there's 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 a lack of um, of respect at times for these sorts of traditional traditional sources of knowledge, and that can be reflected in the setting and the way that you bring your characters into it. So like the, the tropes that come with farming, it's often like, it's sort of like Mr. Deeds, if you remember that movie, mm -hmm. Adam Sandler, A Ways Back. That's a country boy basically going into the city and like showing him what's what, you know? And it's like that sort of hometown like wisdom and things like that and sort of the rural, rural knowledge kind mm -hmm. of coming to pass. Um, Though I do think it's worth mentioning at this point that yeah. not everything that agricultural communities believe is wisdom. <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's, you know, fair. Like, that's fair. Like, let's yeah, yeah. let's clarify that we are that we are there is wisdom yeah. in these communities, and most often it is found, in my opinion, in people who spend long periods of time working. Yeah, because working a lot tends to give you time to think about things, mm. right? It's in the people who have have lived for for a long time and experienced a lot. But it is a particular kind of wisdom. Mm. And I don't think that it's fair to hold it up as somehow, you know, the the gold standard and say like, well, oh, people yeah. should people should go and live like that instead of going to school or going and oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 becoming yeah, yeah. educated, right? Um, but at the same time, one of the really cool things about, about most of the farmers that I know yeah. is that they are incredibly well-educated about any topic that is important to the running of their farm. Yeah. When I talk to my dairy farmer friends about dairy farming, like the, the level of of insight they have the the number of times they're in in just a given day they're using the scientific method in order to determine what is is actually happening right like people who who are growing crops and and are coming to understand you know with absolute precision how fertilizer impacts their crops and and how um, the amount of like they're measuring the amount of rain they're getting because they know that the amount of rain is going to <laughs> help them figure out how much they have to fertilize in order to get the yield they want. And like mm. there's huge amounts of math involved in farming, yeah, yeah. you know, at, like they run most farms, most places that grow crops run off spreadsheets. Oh, yeah. Now, it used to be that they didn't have spreadsheets. And so all of that was done in a farmer's head. And the successful farmers were able to run the spreadsheet in their head. Yeah. Right. And that's where a lot of that, you know, that wise, that wisdom, I think, comes from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's it's, it's this sort of, I, I, I guess in a lot of ways, the, the thing I'd kind of advocate is that not, like that there there is a density of knowledge that can be acquired there that is easy mm -hmm. easy to miss and like it's fascinating as well because you even mentioned like livestock things like that the different kinds of things that you actually wind up growing and creating in farming it can be really broad like i started to like imagine some of this because with like livestock it's particularly interesting because mm -hmm. you could be a farmer who raises foxes for fur mm -hmm. or giant spiders for silk or mm -hmm. giant snag beetles for armor or something like that. Like there's a million different things that you could sort of do that, that would be fascinating farming wise, like in a, in a, in that a really, that really makes me want to write a book about some guy who's got a farm full of interesting creatures. Yeah. And he's got to figure out how to, how to manage them yeah. and 
It's like, what and do I use this for? <laughs> yeah, what do, like it just, what? Just, it just inherits the farm from like a drow cousin. <laughs> yeah, it's like, what do I yes. do with giants, tag beetles, and spiders? <laughs> How am I supposed to make a farm work with this? Like, I feel like oh, it's full awesome. of spiders. And then, <laughs> now I'm gonna have to write this book. It's because... J.K. Simmons playing the farmer. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No. It's. Uh, but it got me thinking about that because yeah. usually when we think of farming, we think of food. And for those of you who who aren't aware, I'll address the audience quick. Like we're gonna do a three part series on this, starting with farm, going to food, and then to where that food goes in the form of sewage infrastructure. So we're gonna, we're gonna <laughs> dive deep into food, into sewage. Um, so like, you know, be ready for that food comes next, but like we wanted to start with where the food begins, but even then, like, it's not all about food. It's a lot of these right. like side resources get created. I know you talked about cheese, secondary products, sort mm -hmm. of, uh, manufactured products that come from yeah. the dairy when, farms. When I started yeah. doing research into, into a dairy farm and then into making cheese, it, <laughs> I quickly ran into problems. For instance, how many cows can one person actually milk in, you know, in a day, yeah. right? And how much milk do you need to make cheese at any sort of sustainable level for a business, Yeah. right? And so it starts to become a really complex math problem really quickly, right? Mm -hmm. Because in order to make milk, the cows have to be, have to be uh, pregnant or have had a calf recently. Yeah. And so you just end up in this really complex situation where like what seems that's simple- That's a big spreadsheet, right? right? Like that's it's a, a big spreadsheet. It's a big spreadsheet. Yeah. This really simple, you know, um, idea of yeah. like, my guy wants to sell cheese, ends up just becoming really sort the of complexity. complicated. It just magnifies and the complexity. It does. Yeah. And I, but, but I also think that's one of the reasons that this genre is so fascinating to people. Because one thing leads to another, which leads to another, which leads to another, mm. right? It's progression. You can, you can sense the progression. You can sense the growth. Yes. That's really, really satisfying it to is incredibly everybody. Satisfying. Yeah. Yeah. No, and then you throw in some monsters and some sword fights and maybe yeah. a couple, you know, Why a not? couple other things. Yeah, I like I, I don't know. I think I think that's fascinating in there. Like mm -hmm. it's it's again like this sort of level of complexity involved in farming and management and not getting sort of lost in the sauce in that as you're creating it. Right. Like that's that's going to be really, really tricky to do. Um, and I suppose in, in a lot of ways. Like, I, I don't know, I, th I thought about this, I thought about this for a couple of things, because I was like, key takeaways, because like, I love doing nitty gritty stuff like this. I love diving into, you know, specific topics and kind of going in deep in them. But like, one thing that's kind of interesting to me is, is what, what, what would you leverage farming for? Um, yes, within Lit RPG, I like this idea of progression and growth. But then one of the things I thought about was, there's a lot of embedded culture in mm -hmm. agriculture and sort of like inquiring about agriculture in your setting can mm -hmm. be useful to sort of establish some baseline elements of culture, you know, like, uh, like the sort of, uh, my, my buddy, I remember, um, when I was younger, uh, I asked him which way North was and he just pointed and I go, how do you know which way North was? He just went, I'm Cornish. Like, I always, <laughs> I always know which way North is kind of thing. And like, there's an element to which like this sort of agriculture culture like helps you you that there, there is there is something there that shows the aliveness of your setting and the aliveness mm -hmm. of your world that i think is is a really kind of useful and interesting thing to have considered but like is there anything else that you think like introducing an element of agriculture livestock all that kind of stuff and throwing it into a setting what can it do i think it does give a really good um, baseline for the kinds of people who are in your world. Yeah. Because especially if you're, if you're doing fantasy, right? If yeah. you're building in a fantasy world, then, then the place people start is on the farm. Yeah. Even if the person, farm boy. Yeah, right, right. even if the it. person lives in a city, yeah, yeah. right? Their ancestor was probably a farmer yeah. or a shepherd or well, it's, it's 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 where so many cultures start you can't be stationary exactly as right. a culture until you can until grow you enough farming food. until one person can grow more than food more more food than they need for one person right like, and that's that doesn't happen until you farm absolutely yeah. and so using that as sort of the baseline for everything 
is, I think, a really good shorthand. If your farmers can read, yeah. everybody in the society can read. Yeah. Because the farmer is the person with the least amount of time to learn how to do that. Yeah. If the farmers know how to count coins, everybody in your society can count coins. Because again, the farmer is the person with the least amount of time to be educated there, there in those be, things. There has to be enough of a benefit to investing the time to do it. Correct. Such that, yeah, okay, I follow. Right? Yeah. If your if your farmers uh, are are farming at scale, mm. then they either have then your society either has some sort of um, technology, mm. or and and that could be as simple as as a plow, right? Oh yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. they have some level of technology, or you have a slave culture. Yeah, right. And so there are like the way you build your farms determine all sorts of interesting things about your society as a whole. Yeah. Now, if you're in It's like a building block in a lot of it, ways. It's, it's it is a starting, foundation. Yeah, yeah. Right? You absolutely. build you build your terrain and you d determine what kind of farming you <laughs> Where's have. Where's the arable land? <laughs> and pretty much. You're good to go. Or yeah. you know, is it terrace farming? Is it do we have a complex um uh system for flooding fields with with irrigation? Yeah, like the right? Nile. And so yeah. there are all sorts of different ways that you can do that, but how you do that, because farming is, is sort of the base of society, how you build your farms determines how everything else extrapolates outward. Well, yeah, because you're also going to, from there, be able to establish the locations of your major population centers, depending on technology levels and like right. logistical sophistication. Like your city is going to be is going to be where the food is. <laughs> like you right. know, it's not going to be away from there, right. unless you have technology such that you can move it. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And so this can lead to, I think, a lot of really just cool questions about how your world works. And then those questions about how your world works can inform how the people interact with that world. Yeah. And plus, it's always fun when your party is tromping by, whether they are they have been successful or unsuccessful in whatever quest they're on, to have some old grizzled farmer leaning up against a gate, chewing on a piece of corn stalk, like yeah. staring at them. Yeah. And being like, why are you wasting your time with that? <laughs> There's milking to be done. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I, I think that about covers it for farming on this episode of the World Craft Club. I know somebody was watching this that knows more than me. Uh, maybe not Seth, but at least about cheese. But like, you know, feel free to jump on in the comments and talk to us a little bit about what we might have missed with farming. I know there's tons of important stuff out there and the server went absolutely bananas when I asked about this. So I know there's more content. So here's the deal. Farming forms the sort of irre irreducibly foundational element of a culture. It's where staying in one place becomes a thing. It's the birth of a culture. Like Seth had said, like you can sort of take a look at a farmer and from that person within the culture understand where they're at. There's also a ton of embedded wisdom and, and knowledge in the process of farming that often isn't categorized in the same way that we usually do in our culture. So you have a lot of embedded wisdom and knowledge of the stars and weather patterns and those spreadsheets in your head that kind of predates some of our scientific method. It was won through years and years and years of trial and error. So not discounting that native wisdom is a really interesting thing to just sort of consider in your, in your, in your settings and establishing that. Did I miss anything, Seth? No, I think that's pretty much it. All right. So with that, I've been your host, James. And for Seth, producer Dave, and editor AJ, wherever he is, this has been another episode of the Worldcraft Club. Thanks so much for watching. He played Mustafa. Oh, that's right. <laughs> he dies like in the open. I'm still alive, but I'm very badly burned. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the... <laughs>